on this Thursday night, an arrest in one of America's worst security breaches. The young National Guardsman accused of leaking classified documents. This was a deliberate criminal act. How long before the breach was noticed and does this arrest plug the leak? The rise in pro-Russian hackers targeting critical infrastructure, including in Canada. Stopping sextortion. I'd call it an epidemic. One province's new law to protect children. And why Mary Quant mattered. You know, she just did so much for women and, and, and kind of empowerment. A trailblazing British designer who revolutionized women's fashion. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with extraordinary scenes of an arrest in the United States. The FBI moved in on a home in suburban Massachusetts, arresting a suspect believed to be behind the leak of a trove of classified documents. That's him slowly walking backwards with his hands over his head. The Pentagon accuses the 21-year-old of a criminal deliberate act. Today, the Justice Department arrested Jack Douglas Teixeira, in connection with an investigation into alleged unauthorized removal, retention, and transmission of classified national defense information. The Defense Department has worked for days to find the source of the leaks, which it calls a serious risk to national security. They reveal sensitive secrets about both allies and adversaries in Russia's war on Ukraine. Our Washington Bureau Chief Jackson Prosco is with me now. Jackson, what do we know about the suspect? Hi, Donna. 21-year-old Jack Teixeira is a technology support staffer for the Air National Guard at a base on Cape Cod. Thursday, he was arrested without incident by the FBI, accused of illegally sharing classified defense information. The New York Times reports he began sharing classified documents with a small online chat group on the platform Discord. Now, reports suggest at first he was transcribing documents, and then later he began printing those documents off and posting photos of them those documents. Those photos were eventually posted to a public forum by one of the chat group's members. Now, the documents reveal highly sensitive material, including U.S. assessments of how the war in Ukraine is going. They also reveal the depth of U.S. infiltration of Russia's military command. The Pentagon is deeply worried because some of the intelligence that was leaked was brand new, just a few weeks old. We do have stringent guidelines in place for safeguarding classified and sensitive information. This was a deliberate criminal act, a violation of those guidelines. Jackson, they've got one suspect in custody. Is there a sense this will plug the leak or that the Pentagon knows the full extent of who might be involved? Well, at this point, early reports suggest Teixeira may have only intended to share these documents with that smaller group of online friends. But based on the language we heard used by the U.S. Attorney General today, he will likely be facing charges under the Espionage Act and a decade or more in prison if convicted. In fact, each leaked document could turn out to be its own charge. This is also likely to prompt a broader review, though, of access to classified information across U.S. intelligence agencies and the military. It really raises questions about why low-level employees should be able to see such high-value documents. It is absolutely clear at this stage that the U.S. intelligence community writ large has to get its house in order. This is just not sustainable. No other country is leaking information at that scale. I can see a number of, of areas where reform could be, uh, could be at least approached and considered. It's early, but experts suggest this is among the most damaging and embarrassing intelligence leaks in U.S. history. What's even worse here, Donna, is that it seems these leaked documents were online for nearly a month before the Pentagon became aware. Okay, Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. There was a heads up today from Canada's cybersecurity agency, the CSE. It says there's been a notable rise, especially in the last few weeks, of cyber threat activity by Russian-aligned actors, including malicious cyber activity directed at critical infrastructure networks. Mackenzie Gray is with me from Ottawa. Mackenzie, do we know who has been targeted? 
No, we don't, Donna. The head of the communications security establishment wouldn't give any specifics, but it's rare for them to even speak with us about cyber threats. And this was an interesting conversation they had with us today. They did underscore the fact, though, that there hasn't been any of these threats materializing and there wasn't any key damage to the infrastructure. But they reiterated that threats posed by foreign countries and non-state hackers are real. And they say that one of the main countries they're worried about is Russia. And that country was able to bring down Hydro-Quebec's mobile app and website earlier this morning through what's called a denial of service attack, which basically shuts down a website for a period of time, but doesn't take any sensitive data. And Hydro-Quebec was quick to underscore that, saying their critical systems weren't affected and no data or personal info was stolen. But Donna, this is just the first of many Russian cyber attacks recently on Canadian targets. Over the past couple of days, they were able to take down the sites of the Port of Quebec, Laurentian Bank, and even the Prime Minister's website was taken down by a pro-Russian group. Mackenzie, Poland's military counterintelligence sounded the alarm today about a widespread espionage campaign by Russian intelligence targeting NATO members and EU countries. What are they warning of? Yeah, they're trying to draw attention to a pretty sophisticated phishing scam being run by the Russians that actually looks fairly innocent. Now, here's one example. It's an email sent to some Western diplomats that impersonates a Polish embassy employee trying to get other countries' diplomats to sign up for an event at the embassy. And if they click on the link or even add it to their calendar, the Russians can gain access to their computers. And Donna, the polls are warning that this campaign is still ongoing and the Russians are targeting foreign ministries and diplomatic entities, including ones here in Canada. Lots to be on the lookout for. Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks. There is a story about privacy percolating within the Liberal Party. The federal government has signaled it plans to make political parties subject to privacy laws. Right now, the collection of personal information by political parties is subject to almost no rules and no oversight. But in B.C., the federal Liberal Party is taking that province's privacy commissioner to court to prevent being subject to privacy laws. David Aiken is looking into this paradox tonight. David. Well, Donna, it was a single line in the Trudeau government's spring budget right back here, page 254, a promise to introduce a bill that would make federal political parties subject to the same privacy laws as any other business or organization in Canada. As it stands now, the collection of personal information at political rallies or through fundraising or through online and digital campaigns is subject to almost no rules and no oversight. Parties are free to store, trade, or sell that personal information as they please. And they never need the consent of the individuals whose information they have. BC's Privacy Commissioner Michael McAvoy thinks that's a bad idea. Our expectation is that political parties will uh, ensure that people's uh, personal information is, is treated properly and respectfully and legally. McAvoy issued an order that federal parties operating in British Columbia must comply with that province's privacy protection laws. The federal Liberals, along with the federal Conservatives and federal New Democrats, push back. And all three federal parties are taking the B.C. Commissioner to court, challenging his authority. The Privacy Commissioner's action was sparked by a complaint from a retired university professor, Andrew Clement. The federal political parties are in an inherent conflict of interest when it comes to legislating their own behaviour. The way out of that is to show that they're not um, doing any favours, special favours to themselves. The Prime Minister gets the problem. One of the things that we've discovered over, over the past number of years is different provinces are moving forward with privacy regimes that do vary from one uh, region to the next. Uh, it's going to be important that we make sure that our federal electoral system and our federal uh, rules around political parties are uh, homogenous and cohesive. But he would not say when his government will deliver on that budget promise. In the meantime, BC's Privacy Commissioner and the federal political parties are set to face off in court early in May. Donna. All right, David Aiken in Ottawa, thanks. In Alberta, an RCMP investigation is underway after two girls were found dead in a hotel room in the town of Sylvan Lake. Police say they were discovered Sunday morning. Few details have been released. Friends and family say one of the girls is 13-year-old Olivia Dawn Johnson, who was from Red Deer. Sarah Reed is there tonight. Sarah, are there any more details? 
Donna, those who knew Olivia Dawn Johnson say that she was a gift. And even after her passing, they say she continues to be a leader in her community. Olivia, for many years, was a member of the Red Deer Indigenous Dance Troupe. And this week, they gathered to celebrate her life through song, dance and prayer. <laughs> On Facebook, Olivia's mom says her daughter died on Easter Sunday, the same day they brought her home from the hospital 13 years ago after she was born. RCMP are now investigating hers and another girl's deaths after their bodies were found in a hotel room at the Best Western in Sylvan Lake. Police say there are no indications that Olivia and the 12-year-old girl from Sylvan Lake took their own lives or were murdered. They say they are looking into the possibility they died from a drug overdose, but that has yet to be confirmed. RCMP also adds there was a male parent nearby at the time, but would not provide any more details. The medical examiner's office is working to determine the cause of death and will be running a toxicity test. In the community where the tragedy happened, people are finding the news difficult to process. The girls' deaths have deeply impacted their community. Here in Red Deer, there's been an outpouring of support for Olivia's family. And they do plan on gathering here next week to celebrate her life and to say their final goodbyes. Donna? All right, Sarah Reed in Red Deer, Alberta. Thanks. There are concerning new details about serious flaws in Ontario's child welfare system. A damning report by Ontario's ombudsman points to a lack of oversight, limited options and questionable care. The report focuses on the case of one vulnerable Indigenous girl who is sent to foster care homes far from her northern Ontario community. The 13-year-old with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and a history of trauma went missing seven times while in the care of Johnson Children's Services. Once she vanished for nine 19 days, putting her, the report says, at significant risk of human trafficking. She was supposed to get one-on-one -on -one supervision, but Johnson Children's Services failed to protect her from what the report calls evidence of drugs, physical and sexual assault. The report makes 58 recommendations which have been accepted. Our chief investigative correspondent, Carolyn Jarvis, is with me. Carolyn has been reporting on Ontario's child welfare system for more than a year. Carolyn, this is a damning report about one girl. What strikes you the most? Well, fundamentally, Donna, that we have a system in place that allows this to happen with little oversight and weak or delayed consequences for companies that break the rules. This foster care agency, Johnson Children's Services, was already the subject of a scathing investigation paid for by the province in 2019. That report looked into foster homes it operated in the Thunder Bay area and exposed serious concerns about the care it was providing. A 17-year-old Indigenous girl named Tammy Kiyash ran away from one of those homes and was found dead the next day. The province forced Johnson Children's Services to shut down their foster care homes in the north, but in a stunning move allowed them to keep operating homes in the south. And so here we are today in a tragic situation that some say was preventable. I should add, we reached Johnson Children's Services on the phone today, but they declined to comment. The province also wouldn't answer our questions about why it allowed Johnson's to keep operating in the south. Carolyn, your investigative reporting is focusing on the treatment of Indigenous youth in the child welfare system who are often sent far from their communities. What does this report say about that process? Well, there's a harrowing line where the Children's Aid Society in the North, which placed the 13-year-old girl in a Johnson's foster home, admits it was warned by another agency not to do it. But, quote, desperation sets in, they said, because there are no resources in the North. The Ombudsman, Paul Dubé, underscored this in an interview with us today, that Northern communities, especially Indigenous communities, are at such a significant disadvantage when it comes to supports for youth in care and youth who have higher needs that too frequently they are sent South, which is a form of culture shock that only adds to their trauma. All right. Carolyn Jarvis in Toronto tonight. Thanks. And a little later, we look at how one province is working to better protect children and teenagers from sextortion. That's coming up. But first, thousands of first responders from across the country were in Trois-Rivières today for the funeral of Sergeant Maureen Bro. She is the Quebec provincial police officer who was killed in the line of duty last month. Bro was stabbed two weeks ago while trying to make an arrest. The 42-year-old was a veteran officer with more than 20 years experience. These men and women, despite their dedication, despite their commitment, are first and overmost and foremost human beings who are subjected to difficult, 
dangerous and sometimes fatal conditions. Bro was the eighth police officer to die on the job in Canada in the last six months. More than a foot of rain in Florida's south coming up, the rescues and the record-breaking rain wreaking havoc. All right, I'm going to go back and get your mommy and daddy, all right, bud? Dozens of people had to be rescued in South Florida, and several flood emergencies remain in effect there tonight. A fierce and slow-moving spring storm produced supercell thunderstorms and torrential rain. More than 50 centimeters of rain fell over Fort Lauderdale, that city's rainiest day in history. Even the airport is flooded. All flights in and out of Fort Lauderdale's International Airport are canceled until tomorrow. Former U.S. President Donald Trump was back in New York City today for a second deposition in a $250 million civil fraud case. Trump was questioned under oath in the lawsuit brought by the state's attorney general. It accuses Trump, his family business, and three of his children of overstating the value of assets by billions of dollars to get tax benefits and preferential loans. It is a high-stakes case that threatens the operation of Trump's business empire in New York State. He denies any wrongdoing. Last week, Trump was in New York to plead not guilty to 34 felony counts stemming from hush money payments to an adult film star. The U.S. Justice Department will take the fight over access to a widely used abortion pill to the Supreme Court. Late yesterday, a federal appeals court imposed several barriers to accessing the medication. It bars sending it through the mail, being prescribed by health care providers who are not doctors, and excludes use by those more than seven weeks pregnant. The U.S. Justice Department says it strongly disagrees with the decision and wants to protect Americans' access to safe and effective reproductive care. The pill is the most common method of ending pregnancies in the U.S. Still ahead, one province's attempt to better protect children and teens from sextortion. Sexual extortion is on the rise, and how to go after those who share intimate images of others without their consent is a huge problem. People of all ages can be exploited, but often the victims are children and teenagers, and increasingly young boys. Neetu Garcha reports on what's being done in one province to better protect children from online exploitation. Jean-Marie Hatung says she was just 14 when intimate images of her were posted online without her consent being afraid to open my phone and answer an email or go on to Instagram. The now 19-year-old international student at Dalhousie University says she's studying to become a lawyer in Canada and wants to support other victims with similar experiences. It has made me a stronger person being able to now talk about it and being able to now reach out and tell people what had happened. As long as nobody talks about it, it continues. Surrey, B.C. high school social justice teacher Annie Ohanna says about once a month a student comes to her saying they're experiencing some kind of violence online. You see kids sharing devices, you see kids sharing images, like you know everybody knows this. So first of all, no judgment. So how do you incorporate this into your curriculum? Mm. I start with that idea of respect and consent. Are we really giving them the, the, the skill set to know what red flags there are? But also then let's say something is happening, how to report it early and often. In response to tragedies like Amanda Todd, who was 15 when she died by suicide after years of sextortion, BC's government recently passed what it calls the Intimate Images Protection Act. So the whole design of it is to be an online portal that's 24-7, 24 hours a day on your phone. You can make an application to the Civil Resolution Tribunal, the perpetrator, to actually be given an order to say, take it down. Statistics Canada says there was a nearly 80% increase in cyber-related extortion offences in 2020 from the year before. The Canadian Centre for Child Protection says that number continues to rise. Oh, I'd call it an epidemic. The situation is completely out of control. We, we can barely keep up. The centre says many cases are money motivated and there's a spike in boys being targeted. They're tricked into believing they're speaking with a teenage girl. They do something sexual. It's recorded on the other side and then the threats ensue. It's OK. It happens. It, you are here now and we can help you. Jean-Marie is encouraging other victims to reach out for help, saying it was support from loved ones and years of therapy that's helped her walk away from living in constant fear. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. 
Inspiring and influential. Next, the impact of fashion designer Mary Quant. The fashion world lost a trailblazer today. British designer Mary Quant has died at the age of 93. She grew up with austerity during the war and in the 1960s decided to transform the way women dress, ditching the corseted, often demure look of her mother's generation and focusing on fun, frivolity and women's liberation. Eric Sorensen explains why Mary Quant mattered. It was a new era called the Swinging 60s, and fashion designer Mary Quant was not only at the center of it, she helped create it. Quant made a daring break from conservative and corseted women's fashions, turning long skirts into mini skirts. Her taste may be a bit outlandish for some, but she's certainly got a flair for withered clothes for withered girls. Quant added color and fun, styles that made Twiggy famous, and exported the hip London culture that transformed how women around the world wanted to dress and be seen. She believes that girls were made to be looked at, not covered up. One started to get this independent, outgoing, very young, very alive look that came in in the 60s. And they expressed all the emancipation that was um, about to, to happen then. Even Quant's bob haircut by Vidal Sassoon was trend-setting. A recent documentary captured her philosophy, don't be boring. The point of clothes should be, one, that you're noticed, two, that you look sexy, and three, that you feel good. Conservative society didn't like it. Oh, I can't say that I particularly approve of some of the stars. But Quant was undaunted. She bought rolls of fabric, constantly experimented, and believed in mass-producing fashions that would help liberate women. Her legacy is the beginning of swinging London, the real swinging London, and how we remember it. The Sexualized styles and presentation can still shock, but Quant was a pioneer, unleashing a sense of freedom for women to dress and to be however they wanted. You know, she just did so much for women and, and, and kind of empowerment and, you know, the whole kind of sexual liberation. So, you know, she changed the, the way women were in society, I feel. Some of her styles look out of step with today's trends. But it was Mary Quant's groundbreaking fashions that pushed back against the repressive treatment of women half a century ago. That is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this foggy forest in North Vancouver, B.C. Thanks for watching. For our NASA will be at the anchor desk tomorrow, and I'll see you Saturday for the new reality. Bye bye.